Good evening. My name is Dr. Denise L. Jones, and I'm privileged to serve as Vice President for Academic Affairs at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. On behalf of President Anderson and all of my colleagues, we thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Trinity University Press, in collaboration with the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission, is honored to present The Nation Must Awake. This is a vital conversation on the Tulsa Race Massacre and Mrs. Mary E. Jones Parrish, author of one of the most important books to chronicle this horrific event. As a nonprofit cultural and educational publisher, Trinity University Press is committed to an evolving agenda of work that engages, questions, and brings us together as a community. And we are proud to be publishing Mrs. Parrish's essential book, The Nation Must Awake, My Witness to the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921 to a wide audience for the first time. To recap the scenario in the text, Mrs. Mary Parrish was reading in her home on the evening of May 31st, 1921. Her daughter, Florence Mary, called the young journalist and teacher to the window. Mother, she said, I see men with guns. The two eventually fled and unwittingly became eyewitnesses to the death of hundreds of Black Oklahomans and to the destruction of the Greenwood District, a prosperous Black area known nationally as Black Wall Street. The Nation Must Awake is Ms. Parrish's first person account compiled along with the recollections of nearly two dozen others and published almost immediately following the massacre in a tiny edition under the name Events of the Tulsa Disaster. This publication detailed what is now recognized as the single worst incident of racial violence in US history. Joining us in conversation tonight are writer and editor, Mrs. Annalisa M. Bruner, Mrs. Parrish's great-granddaughter, along with the author of the book's foreword, Dr. Scott Ellsworth. He is a lecturer of Afro-American and American African Studies at the University of Michigan. He is also the author of Death in a Promised Land and another new book titled The Groundbreaking, An American City and Its Search for Justice. Joining these individuals is our own Dr. Clary Lattimore, Associate Professor of African-American History at Trinity University and an expert on the African-American history of San Antonio, Texas. Additionally, he is this year's recipient of the coveted ZT Scott Award. Each year, Trinity University honors one Trinity faculty member with the Dr. and Mrs. Z.T. Scott Faculty Fellowship for Excellence in Teaching and Advising. This fellowship consists of a cash award and an additional stipend to be used by the recipient to enhance his or her professional development as a teacher and advisor. Dr. Lattimore will be recognized at our spring commencement ceremonies this Saturday. I must share with you that it is an honor and a privilege to have this illustrious group here tonight, especially Annalisa, who I had the wonderful opportunity to talk with earlier this week. She is passionate about carrying on this incredible legacy of her great-grandmother, Mrs. Mary Parrish, who, along with the actual event itself, are nearly forgotten from history. I'm hopeful that her story and the millions of other silenced voices of the African-American experience will evidently be heard 
and included in an accurate historical manner, not just tonight, but as a point of righting a wrong by speaking the truth to power toward true reconciliation. I am now going to turn over the virtual microphone to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Carrie Lattimore, who will be our navigator of tonight's critical conversation. Dr. Lattimore. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones, and thank you for your leadership and the way that you steered Trinity University over the last five years. It is my honor to be here tonight and to speak and to be here to listen to the, the words of Mary Jones Parish, but also of Mrs. Bruner and Dr. Ellsworth. And they are here to join us and they are ready to bring in a tremendous conversation. And I wanted to thank each and every one of you who are with us virtually and to thank Trinity University Press and the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission for all of their work to facilitate the discussion of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. Viewers are welcome to send in their questions via the Q&A and we will be asking those questions by Q&A throughout the evening. Um, I'm gonna start the questions because we only have a certain amount of time and I'm gonna to refer to our panelists as Annalisa and Scott by their first name, they can refer to me as the same. And the first question is gonna to be to both of them to kind of ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves, um, tell us a little bit about themselves, um, why Tulsa is important to them and something interesting about each one of them. I will start with Annalisa. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much for having me. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Thank you, Scott. I'm Annalisa M. Bruner. I am a long-term resident of Washington, DC, but I am originally from the Bay Area, San Francisco, California. That is where my grandmother, Mary, uh, excuse me, Florence Mary Parrish Bruner, ended up after um, in adulthood. And uh, my father uh, also moved to uh, California and that's where I was born and raised um, until the age of 18. The interesting thing that I'd like to say this evening is that although I have this very rich history in my own family, I have never been to Tulsa. For the first time, I will be there next week uh, for this and through the centennial. Uh, and very sadly, my father never mentioned a word about any of this, neither did my grandmother. So this is a journey for me as well, a journey of discovery, a journey of rediscovery, and an internal journey of where I, where I belong because of where I came from. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Scott Ellsworth. Uh, I am a, a native Tolson, born and raised. And like many Tulsans of my generation, uh, it was very difficult to find out anything about the Tulsa Race Massacre. I had heard rumors as a child growing up in the 1960s. Uh, you would hear adults sometimes discussing it. And when you would enter the room, they would change the subject or uh, lower their voices. Um, I began researching and writing about the massacre uh, in 1975 when I was a uh, the summer between my junior and senior years in college. I wrote my senior thesis about what we then called the race riot. Uh, and that later became, um, well, really the second book uh, about uh, the massacre, Death in a Promised Land, which came out in 1982. Um, in 1997 through 2000, I served as the head scholar for the uh, Tulsa Race Riot Commission. Uh, uh, I started the search for the mass graves at that point. Um, and uh, we were caught up in politics. That search was shut down uh, until two years ago when the uh, deputy mayor of the city asked me to help get that going again. Um, so I'm involved with this in, in two ways. Um, uh, I've been deeply involved in the search for the mass graves in October. We located one in Oaklawn Cemetery. And this coming June 1st, we're going to begin the exhumation of that grave. Uh, also, I've written a, a new book about the massacre and its legacy uh, titled The Groundbreaking. It came out two days ago. Excellent. Thank you so much, Scott. And I wanted to kind of piggyback off of something that you said, and you noted the difference in a riot and a massacre. 
And the difference in, you know, the earliest things that I heard was there was a riot, and now we use the term massacre. Could you tell us a little bit about that? And as you do so, please tell us a little bit for those who may not be as aware of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Tell us a little bit about the massacre, what caused it, what happened, and a little bit about the aftermath. Sure, I'll try to be brief. It's, uh, it's hard to condense that story. Uh, just going to terminology, look, the, uh, what we now call today, the massacre has been called a number of things. It's been called a disaster, an event, uh, a pogrom. Um, I once referred to it as an American crystal knocked, uh, which is a reference to the, the night when the Nazis attacked synagogues and, and uh, Jewish stores and homes in, in Germany. Uh, the term race riot was, was in 1921, that was the term. And uh, uh, that was used by African-American newspapers, white newspapers. Uh, and everyone knew that that referred to some sort of a racial incident that then blossomed into something larger and, and much worse with African-Americans getting attacked by whites in downtown areas, but most importantly by white mobs invading black communities intent on murder, arson, looting and all that. There, there were dozens of these that happened all over the country. But over the years, the term race riot began to be applied to other things. Um, what we now call the racial rebellions of the 1960s in Detroit and elsewhere, those were known as race riots. Um, the violence that followed the, uh, you know, the exoneration of the police officers and the Rodney King verdict, that was referred to as a race riot. So there, I would say since the 1990s, there's been some pressure to change the name and the massacre. Um, I, you know, the reality is I don't think we have a good term for what happened in Tulsa. That's, that's the truth of the matter because it's so off the scale. But uh, you know, I certainly am, am happy to use the word massacre. Uh, I'm gonna probably slip into race riot. That's what the survivors called it. They called it the riot. And that's something I've used for a long time. But none of these words are perfect. They all have issues with them. But very briefly, as Dr. Jones mentioned, the Tulsa Race Massacre was the single worst incident of racial violence in American history. So in the course of 16 hours, more than 1,000 African-American homes and businesses were looted and burned to the ground by a white mob. Um, nearly 10,000 people were made homeless. Um, uh, to this day, we have no idea how many people died. I think reasonable estimates go from somewhere in the 70s to as high as 300. Uh, but the fact is, we don't know if, if the number is 79 or if it's 300. And we also don't know what the ratio is between black and white casualties. Um, you know, we could talk more about the era. This is a very perilous time for African Americans. Uh, but essentially, the, uh, the massacre was a result of a, uh, of a fantastic and lurid and racist write up of an alleged incident in a Tulsa elevator. Uh, in which the newspaper, the white newspaper, also ran an editorial entitled Two Lynch Negro Tonight, uh, referring to a 19-year-old African-American shoe shiner named Dick Rowland, who was uh, accused falsely of attempting to rape a white uh, teenage elevator operator. Um, a lynch mob gathered outside the courthouse where Rowland was held uh, at 100, 200, 500, 800, 1,000 people. Uh, and when word hit Greenwood of the peril that this young man was in, uh, groups of African-American World War I veterans uh, organized uh, around 7.30 that night. Um, uh, 25 black vets went down to the courthouse, presented themselves to the sheriff and offered their services to help defend Roland. They were sent away, uh, which they did, but their presence also electrified this white lynch mob who then was determined to arm itself. Then around 10 o'clock that night, a false rumor hit Greenwood that the lynch mob, the whites were storming the jail. This time 75 black vets went again back down to the courthouse, presented themselves to the, uh, uh, to the sheriff. Uh, they were turned away as they were leaving. An elderly white man tried to wrestle away a gun from a tall African-American veteran. A shot went off and the massacre begins. Uh, very briefly, um, we don't know how many people died in that in initial incident, but what we do know is the Tulsa police force, which had been absent, now showed up. And rather than trying to disarm or send the white mob home, 
And the mob now doesn't care about Dick Rowland. They are now out to kill any black person they can find. But the Tulsa police, they deputized members of the mob. They also gave them rifles, pistols, and shotguns. Um, during that evening, the first fires were set on the borders of the Greenwood community. Uh, whites in cars made drive-by shootings down black residential neighborhoods, shooting into children's bedrooms, living rooms, you know, houses on either side. There was sort of a, there was a, uh, an attempt to invade Deep Greenwood, the heart of the black commercial district, but that was fought off by black property owners. And so at about two o'clock in the, on the early morning hours of June 1st, there was a sense amongst some African-Americans that the problems were over. We've gotten through this issue, things are gonna be okay. What they didn't know is that whites were organizing that night and uh, um, getting their neighbors, arranging for ammunition swaps, trading guns and whatnot. And they planned a dawn invasion. And in fact, at dawn on June 1st, we had a mob of whites numbered in the thousands. We don't know how many began this invasion of Greenwood and systematically going block by block, uh, people who resisted were killed. Others were, quote, arrested and taken to, under armed guard to um, internment centers. Whites then broke into businesses and homes, uh, stole stuff, and then set these on fire. And you ended up having 35 square blocks burn. Um, African-Americans fought back uh, ferociously. There were a number of gunfights, but they were simply outnumbered. Uh, whites outnumbered Blacks 10 to 1 in Tulsa. And African-Americans had to deal with some new, uh, you know, horrors as well. The Local white National Guard units, rather than trying to disarm the white mob, instead set themselves along the edges of some white neighborhoods and pointed their machine guns into Greenwood and opened fire. We also know that airplanes were flying above Greenwood uh, that morning. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that at least one airplane that a co-pilot dropped sticks of dynamite on Greenwood. Um, that being said, Greenwood was destroyed from the ground. So this was a horrific event. Um, no white person ever spent a week in prison for any of the murders, uh, uh, arson or, or looting that occurred. Wow. Thank you so much for really succinctly explaining what happened in Tulsa. And we've got a couple of questions in the q and I'm gonna to move to that. And for those of you who've been, um, who are thinking about asking a question, please continue to do so. Um, and this question I think is, is for Dr. Ellsworth, but I think it's also for um, Ms. Bruner as well. Um, and I'm going to kind of summarize a question. It's what situations was Tulsa discussed? And I know that Ms. Bruner uh, mentioned that it was never discussed, but I'd kind of like to know how she found out about it and what her family discusses about it today. And also to Dr. Ellsworth, um, how were those conversations that you heard about Tulsa in your earlier years, how was it brought up? Were you told to be quiet if you heard it or Kind of tell us a little bit about how that was. So we'll start with Annalisa. Thank you for that question. Well, as I said, I didn't know a thing about it when I was growing up. I didn't learn about the massacre from my own family until I was 35 years old. My father gave me a book. I had gone to his house. Um, I was visiting home over the holiday, the Christmas holiday. And he took me into his room and said he had something to, to show me, something to give me. And he went through his papers and he was a real gregarious guy, normally, you know, real jovial, lots of fun. He was very serious, which was very, very unusual. So I knew that he had something important to say. From among his papers, he pulled out a manila envelope and he pulled from that a small red volume, cloth bound, very slim. And he said, this is a book that your great grandmother wrote in Tulsa. And uh, I want you to see if you can do anything with it. I was called Lisa at that time. He said, Lisa, you are now the matriarch of the family and I want you to do something with this. I had no idea what he was talking about. He didn't explain anything further. When I went back home to DC that January, which would have been 1994, I sat down and read through the book in one sitting. As you can imagine, I was flabbergasted, stunned. My jaw fell to the floor. I couldn't believe two things. I couldn't believe that this had happened. Secondly, I could not believe 
that my father nor his mother, my grandmother, had ever spoken one word about this, nor had I ever even heard them in hushed tones saying anything at all. So that's how I learned about the story. That's how I came into, into possession of the small volume, Events of the Tulsa Disaster that uh, Dr. Ellsworth mentioned by Mrs. Mary Jones Parrish. That's an amazing story. I, thanks so much for sharing that. Um, I, I, one thing I think that's important to point out is that the massacre in, in White Tulsa, the history of the massacre was actively suppressed for 50 years. Um, official records disappeared. Both of Tulsa's white daily newspapers uh, went out of their way never to mention the massacre. Um, and you had researchers as late as the 1970s who had their lives and their careers threatened for even investigating this. So, you know, there was this curtain of silence that descended in white neighborhoods. Um, but interestingly, the massacre wasn't discussed publicly in Greenwood as, as well. And um, it's, it's curious to think about that. The Oklahoma Eagle, which has long been uh, Tulsa's uh, flagship African-American newspaper, would not mention it for decades. On the 25th anniversary in 1946, they had one sentence in the editorial that said, and in 1921, one of the worst race riots in America occurred, period. Didn't even mention that it was Tulsa. And I think that the way to think about, a couple of things to remember is how traumatic this was for survivors. I knew survivors in the 1990s that were still suffering from PTSD. I knew survivors that were concerned to have their photograph taken, that there might be some reprisals against them. There was at least one survivor as late as the 1970s who kept a loaded rifle by his front door, quote, in case it should happen again. But the other way to think about it, I think, is to think of Holocaust survivors. And like Holocaust survivors, many massacre survivors did not want to burden their children and grandchildren with these horrific memories and wanted to instead to try to imagine a better future. So there are, I'm 67, I know descendants my age that didn't learn about the mass, even though their grandparents, you know, uh, it, it had lost their businesses, their homes, they didn't find out about this until they were adults. So as John O'Franklin said, Tulsa lost its sense of honesty. It did for 50 years, and it's taken us about 50 years to get the story out. I wanted to piggyback off of another question that was asked in the Q&A, and that it was a question to uh, Ms. Bruner um, about why, you know, what was her father thinking waiting 35 years? And I guess um, Scott has kind of discussed this a little bit, but waiting 35 years and then saying he wanted you to do something with it. What do you think he wanted you to do with it? And why do you think he waited 35 years? In my opinion, I think he was just waiting for his children to get to a certain age to get to a certain level of maturity to discuss this very serious topic and I th or to know about this very serious topic. And I think that also he himself was lost. He didn't know what to do about it. He, you know, he was a person who had, I guess, sent his children off to school. And as with many uh, persons where you have first generation uh, college educated children, you ask them for their advice, you rely on them, their judgment and their worldliness. So I think that he asked me about it because he knew that I was um, interested in English and books and things of that nature. And I think that he had confidence that I might be able to do something with it that he himself was unable to do or to talk about. And, you know, it is a very interesting thing to think about, as Dr. Ellsworth has said, post-traumatic stress. My grandmother, who lived through this as a child, you don't have to know from her mouth that she experienced post-traumatic stress. You saw it in symptoms, symptoms. For her, it was self-medication with alcohol. And this is, this is I, 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 can't, I cannot imagine that this was not uh, you know, a fairly common occurrence for folks. And once I got this book and my father charged me, that's how I, that's how I interpreted it. He charged me, I did decide that there was something I needed to do and, um, it, it, it actually did change the trajectory of what I was doing for work, as a matter of fact. I'm not gonna go into all of that. It's, it's much too long and convoluted a story, but this inspiration did say to me, 
of this book and knowing what my great grandmother had done and what she was, what, what her profession was, did um, make me have a, you know, kind of a, at the age of 35, between 35 and 40, uh, a, a career change to actually pursue my desire to be a writer. So it was very impactful for me in that regard personally. And then also with the, the notion that I needed to do what I could. And at that moment, I didn't know what it was to, to bring the story forward and to make sure that people knew. Everyone who knows me personally knows that I've talked about this since 1994. They know about it. Um, but sadly, again, as Dr. Ellsworth has said, the broader public has not had the opportunity to know Mary Jones Parrish and her work and her contribution to um, the history of this country and her thoughts about where we needed, what we needed to do and where we needed to be headed. That's an interesting point that you bring up about your great grandmother. And one that I kind of want to hit on for a few moments, who was Mary Jones Parrish and why did she chronicle when she did? And tell us a little bit about what you've learned about her, who she was, and you know her position as a woman, because that's something that's very important as well. She's a woman chronicling these events as a black woman. Um, so in some senses, she's discriminated against because of her gender and also because of her race. So tell us a little bit, let us get to know your great grandmother a little bit. Well, I'll tell you what I know because sadly, and this is one of the tragedies for me, I did not know her personally and neither my grandmother nor my father ever spoke to, to me about her. I, our lives did overlap, but I never met her. For me, she is emblematic. She's emblematic of an intrepid woman, a professional woman, a woman who was married, but divorced early and, and was responsible for her, her young daughter. And in that way, I won't say, you know, I mean, we could talk about direct discrimination against women, for example, but there's the soft discrimination of raising children on your own without the support that would allow you to either, you know, have the career that you wanted or to realize some of the other ambitions that you have. You're busy ch doing childcare. And so, you know, the world in some ways is robbed of your, of your contribution of the richness that you can bring. Despite all that, we have this volume that she left for us. We don't, I don't know of, it, of other writings that she may have left. I would like to explore that. And I'll be doing some research, some legwork when I get to Tulsa. But nevertheless, her contribution was great. Imagine had she been someone in the world who was supported, who had backers, who had resources beyond what she could earn herself at her disposal, imagine what she could have given. And I think that's the, the, the really uh, important lesson here about women and their contribution to society and, and what we lose um, when, when, when uh, they are thwarted. As a historian, Scott, how important is Ms. Parrish's work? Oh, I think this is a hugely important work. I think this is a significant work, uh, you know, in, in uh, you know, American literature, let's say, certainly of the nonfiction literature. Um, Paris was astonishing, and Annalisa, help me on this if I've got this wrong, but I'm trying to recall doing a little research on her. If I recall, she was born in Mississippi, I think, lived for a while in Oklahoma Territory, gets married, she lives in Rochester, New York, then, then comes back to, comes to Tulsa. And, uh, you know, she, she founds this, um, I guess we call it a secretarial school, you know, teaching these office, you know, office skills, uh, typewriting and whatnot to young African-American women who are seeking work. And, you know, what really strikes me about Parrish is, uh, and I, I hope this word is appropriate, but she had a lot of moxie. I mean, she was somebody who was out to make things happen and that really matched the spirit of Greenwood. You know, in Greenwood, there was so much pride. Um, this was, uh, as far as African-Americans as Greenwood went, this is their community. They built it, they operated, they made it work. Obviously there were economic ties to the white Tulsa, I'm not saying that, but there were other African-American female entrepreneurs in Greenwood at the time. Uh, Lula Williams, she and her husband, John, owned the 
Dreamland Theater. They own the East End Garage. They were the first African-American family in Tulsa to own an automobile. They had a three-story building, brick building, where Lula ran a confectionery, you know, a candy and ice cream store on the first floor. The family had their apartment on the second floor. And on the third floor, they rented out offices to Black lawyers, doctors, and dentists. And so she was rubbing shoulders, you know, and is a part of that class of, of uh, very much can-do kind of people who are out to create these things going on. But the book is astonishing. I mean, we get to hear her voice. We get to hear what happened to her and Florence Mary. And then she adds all of this testimony from these other survivors and uh, and detailed testimony. It the, the book, which is originally titled Events of the Tulsa Disaster, and I'm so glad that Trinity University Press has now made it widely available for the first time. This is the most important single source on the history of the massacre, and I think in many ways the most important single source on the history of Greenwood. You know, she's got all of these, you know, facts and figures at the end, listing property loss. It's an astonishing book, and here's another, you know, astonishing part of it. Um, we don't know how many copies were, were printed. I'm, I'm quite confident it was less than 100. I know old timers in Greenwood who everybody, the few copies that were in town, they were all hand numbered. And I know that Don Ross once mentioned that he never saw a number higher than 25. So this is a very precious book. We are so lucky and fortunate, you know, that it's out there and that this could be, you know, shared. This, this book belongs in every library in the United States. I agree, it's a tremendous work. And there's a number of good questions in the Q&A, so I'm gonna ask and kind of combine a couple of questions here. Um, we know more about the Rosewood massacre in some senses than we do Tulsa. At least I heard more about Rosewood than I did Tulsa. Um, and one question is, do you think that the successful efforts in Florida to acknowledge the Rosewood riot um, has influenced what's happening in Tulsa right now? And maybe that explains why we know more about, maybe know more about Rosewood than Tulsa. Or maybe I'm wrong in that. I, I would say that's wrong. We know far more about the Tulsa massacre than, than Rosewood. It's just, it's a whole other scale. I mean, you know, the, uh, the, the report of the Tulsa Race Riot Commission was over 300 pages long. You know, it was hailed by the American Library Association as one of the 10 most important government documents published worldwide that year. There have been numbers of books about the massacre. I, I, I disagree with that, but certainly the, you know, the, the fight for reparations in Rosewood, I think, you know, helped, helped in terms of, of helping to get the Tulsa story out. What, what do you think, Annalise? Any thoughts on that? I, I can't understand where that parallel would be coming from. I, I would need a little bit more information from the, from the questioner. But I think that, you know, the fact that there were, was, were some commercial efforts around that whole, the whole Rosewood situation where so, so it just came to someone's attention uh, who was, you know, cued in or linked in with someone who could bring it to a commercial production much earlier. Um, that's all I can think about. I, I don't know. I would not venture a guess because I don't have enough information to make um, a reasonable and rational um, comparison. There's a couple of questions also in here about why did, you know, why did Tulsa start to come into our imagination? And when did that transition towards where we started to talk about Tulsa start to occur? Was it around the same time, Annalisa, that you heard about it from your, your father? Or was it something national that was bringing this into greater attention? Or was it just we were becoming more aware? It seems like this was happening in the 90s. Um, maybe, Scott, you can also help us with that. Well, in, in my estimation, I think it was just reaching a critical mass of people who knew about it. And I think that that's something that just happens naturally over time. Um, and certainly in the last few years, as we're coming up to the centennial, that's an important anniversary. Um, and it, ha it just so happens, it has coincided with a political situation over the last few years that have brought some of these same issues to the forefront. Um, the uneven application of law enforcement, um, you know, truth in government, uh, you know, the, the, the essence and nature of truth itself. I mean, we talk about this amnesia, but basically those with the reins of power decided that it should not be spoken about. And, and when people have power, they are able to 
impose their will and, and, and affect and bend reality. So the reality, as Mother Flesher said in Congress yesterday, was she was told to her face that this did not happen. So these are, these are you know, really important issues that are unfolding in a historical sense over a long period of time, and they're, and they're actually just coming back around again. That's my estimation. I am not a historian, but I do watch what's happening and I've lived long enough to see how the same themes, historical themes continue to um, you know, ebb and flow. And I think that we're just at a, a, at a critical period right now. And, and uh, we do have to think about you know, the mythologies that we construct about our own selves and, and what can and cannot help happen here. We say, and I've heard this and probably all have, many have, you know, oh, so, certain things can't happen here. Well, one, who, anyone who didn't know about this event might think that this can't ha couldn't happen here. But since it did, I think we're forced to reevaluate what the possibilities are, you know, on the negative plane, basically, about what the dangers are of certain kinds of um, you know, uh, social forces. And I think that we have to be very cautious. We have to be very cautious about, you know, the nature of truth and, and making sure that, that events that happen are truthfully acknowledged and reported. That is a huge deal. And it's something that is a question right now. Excellent, excellent answer. And one of the, um, and did you have any um, comment on that as well, Scott? No, I mean, only in that there, there were, and Annalisa is, uh, Annalisa is completely correct in terms of a critical mass, but there were, there were some specific events that really brought this out. And uh, just very briefly, in the aftermath, when the Oklahoma City bombing happened in 1995, the Today Show flew its crew from New York to broadcast live from Oklahoma City. And during that week, uh, Don Ross, African-American journalist from Tulsa, from Greenwood, who represented Greenwood in the state legislature, later uh, went up to Brian Gumbel, who was the host of the Today Show, and said, as horrible as this event is, there's another story that's not been discussed. Ross gave Gumbel a copy of Death in a Promised Land. 10 days later, the Today Show called me and Dawn to tell us that on the 75th anniversary of the massacre, the Today Show would do a story. This, with the exception of one op-ed in the Washington Post in 1982, this was the first story about the massacre in a national, national media since the 1920s. And once we had the Today Show story, uh, I got on the phone and I got the New York Times, the Washington Post, AP, I think UPI was still in existence, uh, and National Public Radio, all to do stories. Don Ross then took those stories to the governor of Oklahoma and use that to help, to help for the creation of the Tulsa Race Riot Commission. And then when the search for the mass graves that we undertook under the commission, when that story broke in 1998, that then went international. So there are certain events along the way that have brought, it, brought in this to a wider audience. And, and you know, I can't speak you know, uh, you know, more highly in some ways of the impact that Watchmen has had. Watchmen has taken this story, it, obviously a fictionalized version, but it's taken this story around the world. When that first episode came out, I heard from people in Great Britain and elsewhere, this has brought it to an entire new generation. That being said, the one constant that one always hears, and I'm sure that Annalisa has done this as well, heard this as well, is why haven't I heard about this before? Why haven't I heard about this before? And there are reasons for that, but we are making progress. There's a question here, and I think I can go ahead and answer this. Are there, how many survivors are alive today? I think there are three. If I'm, I know that there were three that testified. There's at yesterday. least four that we know of. Okay. And also a little more about the aerial bombing, because I know that some have questioned whether the, the aerial bombing actually not occurred, but what they were actually doing. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? And was it coordinated, do you think? Because this is very early for aerial bombing to happen. Well, it is, and, and that's, that's the issue. So um, in, in Parrish's book, there are a number of accounts of, of Greenwood citizens talking about scene playing, some believing they saw something drop, saw some explosions, others less clear of that. 
there weren't a lot of planes in Tulsa at that time. You know, uh, maybe a half dozen or, or more. Um, they're biplanes, they're open cockpit planes, um, you know, made out of, you know, canvas stretched over wooden frames. Um, so you've got a lot of, you know, wind blowing and whatnot. But um, the story that, that would really help to, um, you know, uh, uh, cement this issue to me, we, in, in the 1990s, I interviewed an elderly white gentleman who talked about getting his hair cut on a particular day in a white North Tulsa barber shop in the 1950s. And he went into the barber shop. There was an older white man getting his hair cut. And this older white man described to the people in the barber shop, this all white barber shop, how on the morning of June 1st, he and another flyer, they were probably World War I vets, had gone up in a plane and they had, and he had dropped sticks of dynamite on Greenwood. And it, it made sense. The idea that you're gonna light a Molotov cocktail when the wind is blowing by at 100 miles an hour, it's, it, it makes no sense. But they had um, waterproof fuses. Somebody could light that with a cigar in their lap and that's gonna go off. But the, the key to it is, is that there was nothing that this white man would have seen published about the bombing of Greenwood in the 1950s. He did not know Mary Parrish's book. There's no way in the world he did. He didn't see some of these accounts in African-American newspaper. So either he just made this up, you know, full cloth or he, or he did it himself. And I'm convinced it was a letter. Wow. There's another question. What are the feelings of the white Tulsa citizens now about the massacre? And I also want to come back to Annalisa and ask her, did she ever have any conversations with her father after the after he presented the book to her? And if so, what were those conversations like? The only thing he would ask me from time to time was, do you still have that book? Do you still have that book? I would reassure him and say, yes, I have it. And I have, I'm making some strides to make sure that it, that it comes to the public. And that was the end of it. He didn't take that opportunity to speak further. He just seemed, he seemed relieved. He seemed relieved. He seemed satisfied. He trusted me. For good reason. So I, you know, I, you know, white people like black people are not of one mind about things. So there's going to be obviously a huge variety of, of uh, responses to the massacre. I know that there are people who hate the fact that it's being brought up. They think that's bad for the city. I know others who are, uh, who are shamed about what happened. I know some who are guilty, feel guilty and heartbroken over what happened. So there's gonna be a wide range of, uh, of emotions on this. I think one thing it's important to remember is because this was suppressed for so long, you have people who are well into their adult lives before they ever learned about this. And it's shocking to them. And, um, and they've had to go ahead and process this. This has caused anguish. This has caused anguish on both sides of the track. But, you know, uh, this is something that happens, has to happen in the United States. We uh, have often taught a very one-sided view of our history. Um, obviously, you know, there's everything right about, you know, teaching about our triumphs and accomplishments. <coughs> But you also have to teach about our shortcomings and failures. And the only way we can learn about our history is if you have an honest accounting for it. So the irony of Tulsa is that um, in some ways, Tulsa is a bit ahead of the game at the moment because we've had this giant skeleton in our closet for a long time and Tulsans have been forced to have to deal with it. And, uh, um, you know, so I think what's going on here may give us some indication on how things are going to go elsewhere. What do you think about that, Annalise? I'm curious. Well, I, I actually think, I think that that's super important. And I wanted to piggyback on that point because in my mind, Tulsa and what happened and how it's being reckoned with up until today is really a crucible for our country. And in terms of looking at it, it was a discrete event. It happened over a couple of days. And you can continue, you, you, it's very, it's complex, but also it is, it's finite. Yeah. And you can, you can really, you know, really get your teeth into it, into the issues, pull back the layers. You can really do some very deep analysis 
because it, it has a distinct beginning and a distinct ending. And, and, and you superimpose that right on you know, the situation. Uh, I think Dr. Ellsworth mentioned there were these black towns all over uh, America, but all over Tulsa, there were black towns where black people sought not separatism, but they sought peace and freedom. And so they were there trying to rely on one another. You know, they had been through all kinds of um, horrific interactions with people who had certain ideologies that were uh, anathema to them and their, and their safety. And so they, they banded together uh, out of a sense of um, self-sufficiency, uh, but also uh, interdependence. And so, you know, when we look at this particular event, it's just something so, um, when I say easy to look at, I don't mean emotionally easy to look at, it's very difficult to look at, but very easy to parse out and look at it from beginning to end and then superimpose that on what we, what we see from then to now and kind of in a compressed, um, in a compressed way, what's going on you know, over the last, I'd say two, a year and a half, two years. And that's how, in fact, I came to uh, Dr. Ellsworth's attention because on January 6th, I wrote a story because I was compelled by what I saw unfolding five miles from my house at the Capitol. And I was reminded, although I didn't live in Tulsa, I was reminded through my grandmother, my great grandmother's work of what had happened and what happens when a mob is incited and unleashed and it terrified me. And when, when I wrote that impassioned story, that's when uh, uh, Dr. Ellsworth reached out to me and I'm so glad he did. To think about the ways in which history repeats itself but also when you think about Tulsa as a community, this is a community in which people are moving into African-Americans, African-American population grows tremendously over a 10 year period, I believe, before the riots, um, before the, the massacre. How, what happens in the aftermath of Tulsa? Do these people keep, do they move away as many I suspect do? Do they continue to build Tulsa? Do they continue to build Greenwood? What stands today of Greenwood? That's one of our questions here. Okay, there's a lot, a lot of material, but um, th there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, my, my personal belief is that very few people left, and I, the vast majority stayed. And, um, you know, in, in part because they didn't have any money and there's no way to, to leave. But, um, but also there was a great, you know, the, one of the ironies is that there was also a great pride in the community after the riot, you know, with W.D. Williams of, of the Williams fam of the Dreamland Hotel, you know, he wrote it was pride that fought the riot and it was pride that rebuilt after the riot. So there was there was certainly no shame in, in into how the community, uh, you know, reacted to it. Um, the other thing that happened, and this is astonishing, we, we, fo we focus oftentimes on this elite class of, of merchants who did quite well in Greenwood. And uh, there was also another class, a group of independent businessmen and businesswomen who were not wealthy by any means, but did well. But the vast majority of adults in Greenwood worked in the white community in service jobs as maids, as cooks, as chauffeurs, as dishwashers, as ditch diggers. They were not allowed to work in the oil industry, but there was plenty of other work. and. Uh, they worked in the white community. There was a lot of money in Tulsa. They got a good paycheck, but they spent it back in Greenwood, which allowed the, 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 uh, uh, the district to grow and to prosper. So what happens astonishingly is within a couple of weeks after the massacre, you see black men and women going back to their jobs in the white community where these same people were who had tried to kill them and uh, destroyed their homes and, and uh, and whatnot, and they go back and money starts to come back into Greenwood, okay? Um, the Williams family rebuilt its three-story brick building in 1922. That's less than a year and a half. It had gone up again. So there, I mean, it's, it's two-sided. On the one hand, the massacre created this trench, this economic trench that African-Americans in Tulsa have never escaped. You know, you can check on all sorts of social indicators, what not going on. The massacre itself has cast a dark city over the shadow of the city that is still very much there today. That being said, the community did rebuild itself and old timers 
We'll talk about how in the 1940s, it was even larger than before. There were more black owned businesses. And then of course it gets destroyed again or attempted to be destroyed by the forces of urban renewal, uh, highway construction, changes in the American economy, you know, in the 1950s, 1960s, which happens in black communities nationwide. So there's, there's a complex history uh, that's there. What's interesting is people are trying to figure out on just one last point, you know, how much generational wealth was lost, okay? And uh, in the June issue of National Geographic that's coming out shortly, uh, there's a graph in there. And what they did is they added up the value of property in 1921 and imagined that the massacre didn't happen and added, you know, 5% or something profit every year and followed that out. And so the amount of generational wealth that would be in Greenwood today if the massacre didn't happen, according to National Geographic, is over $600 million. That is generations of college tuition. It's generations of down payments on houses. It's, um, it's seed money to, to create new businesses. It's health insurance. It's care for the elderly. So there was a huge chunk of money and wealth that was torn out of the community that, the, that, that has not been replaced. And it's measurable there, but it happens e everywhere, yeah. but not, again, in a finite and measurable way, the way you can do it there. And that's why I think this is so important and so emblematic. Your, grand, your great grandmother looked a lot to the past to inform her story of Tulsa. You know, we hear a lot of her discussing World War I in, in, in her text and talking about World War I and how it must have seemed to her like this was a war zone. Um, and that's kind of a sign to us of how the past informs the present and the future. And you mentioned this, Annalisa, a little bit, and I'd like to get more into it. Let's look to the present. And what are the lessons and the messages that we learn from Tulsa for us in the present? Well, I think back to those, very, those two very important points, the preservation of truth, because I just feel that you know, the, the way that truth can be manipulated and, and um, weaponized in many ways, it is reminiscent of what totalitarian regimes do. And, and it, you know, it, it's, it's a way to um, maintain social control and to um, exercise certain agenda that are very narrowly designed to preserve power in the hands of a few. And this is not, this is not what true democracy is. And, I, and I, th I have to say that I think that those black citizens who went there to uphold the law, that was exemplary. Those citizens who behaved and were law abiding folks <coughs> following the rules, that's the true meaning and, and who wanted to exercise their franchise. That demonstrates a commitment to, to our democratic ideals. And I think that it's ironic that these are the folks who you see you know, um, living up to those standards. And, and, and it is very important that we realize that uh, citizenship should not be conditional. And uh, this country has to recognize its African-American citizens just as well as any other. And, the contributions and the commitment to this country. We talked about, you know, um, how sophisticated the people were there. They were aware of their place in the world. They knew what was going on around the world. Uh, you know, uh, one of the, I, I'm not saying that I know this to be the case. I'm simply saying my grandfather, my great grandfather on the other side, he was a returning World War I veteran. These people had seen a lot and they, and they had context for what was happening there, not just, the, not just the massacre, but their lives in general. They knew where they fit in. And this is, and this is crucial, crucial because that was disrupted. You know, they I think that they had begun to have a certain level of confidence because of the success that they were having. They had, you know, uh, over the generations, not too far preceding uh, that this time, had, had arisen out of slavery, out of enslavement. They had uh, achieved education and, and were, it, for, for all uh, intents and purposes, living the American dream. It was snatched away from them and that had to be a great blow. 
Nevertheless, they rebuilt and said, we still believe, we still have, we still are part of the American dream. And this is something that um, I think needs to really be recognized and elevated uh, because we don't see ourselves as other, you know, and, and, and after a long history in this country, we certainly must be seen as part and parcel, equal citizens, equal contributors. And when we see historic firsts that we celebrate today and rightfully so, I have to say, is it that black people weren't ready, that African-Americans weren't ready, or is it just that the country was not ready for us? Because these are accomplished people, hardworking people, industrious people, highly civically involved people, model citizens, if you will. So we have to think about, we have to think about, you know, where that breakdown happens. And, 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 and much of it has to do with mythologies and truth telling. We also have to, as I said before, remember that it can happen here. And that's what we, we have to be, that's what we have to keep our eye on. I just want to pick up on just one brief thing uh, that um, uh, that Annalise has said, and and you know what's gotten forgotten in this story, I think, are those courageous seventy-five African American veterans who went down to the courthouse. I don't think a single one of them knew Dick Rowland. There's no reason to think that they would have, but they knew that a racial brother was in danger of being murdered, and they didn't go to break him out of jail. They went to go and to make sure he got a trial, even a rigged Jim Crow trial. And some of those, they all risked their lives. Some of them gave their lives. To me, they are as worthy as our praise as the farmers at Lexington and Concord, you know, who stood on Concord Bridge and fired the shot heard around the world. These are model American citizens. I think that there needs to be a memorial to them right in downtown Tulsa, right where the courthouse was at 6th and Boulder or 4th and Boulder. And, and these are people that are, that are again, people that we all can learn from, be impressed by their courage, by their forthrightness, and they tell a story that we, that we need to share. I agree. Scott, you mentioned we don't know the number of how many people died. But if I think back to Nat Turner's rebellion, we know the names of all the white people who died mm -hmm. in that, although we don't know the African-Americans who died afterwards. Why do we just not know I mean, 75 to 300, that's such a variance. Why, why, why so little information on that? Well, you know, I mean, we do know some names. We, we know over 50 names easily, and we might even be in, into the 60s at this point. So there's a different bunch of reasons. Again, things were sort of clamped down for different reasons in both the black and white communities. This is something that it's not talked about a lot. But also we have to, re, you know, um, the, the white dead and Nat Turner's rebellion, they, uh, they had plenty of family members who, you know, wrote to newspapers. These were things that, that produced a lot of print about that. You didn't have that same amount of print being produced about the massacre. We also in, are in an age where people don't have photo IDs. You know, they're, they, you know, it's just harder to find people. They show up every 10 years in city directories or rather in sense, federal census, we have annual city directories and that might be a clue. But, you know, and again, you know, the other thing to remember about the family histories is everything these people own, all the family Bibles with the genealogies in them, all of the photographs, photo albums, those were all destroyed during the massacre as well. So you have this, this, this group of people whose, who's, you know, existence on a certain level in official documents has been snuffed out. There's a question on Facebook, um, and I'm not getting all of them, but I just got this one. Um, Oklahoma, you've got the Native American population. What's the relationship, and this is probably more to um, Dr. Ellsworth, what's the relationship between a Native American population and the African American population? Is there any kind of ties that we can come up with in the treatment there and also with the Tulsa massacre? Well, I, you know, there's a lot of good work. I, I would encourage the, the uh, um, you know, the questioner, you know, to look up Blacks in Oklahoma, look up the history of African-Americans in Oklahoma. African-Americans have been in Oklahoma a long time. They essentially predate any white uh, uh, settlers in the state. 
you know, obviously there were African Americans who were enslaved by Southern tribes that were brought to Oklahoma to Indian Territory in the 1830s. So there's a long and very complex history. And, you know, Oklahoma is a state, I think it's a state that um, where the largest percentage of its citizens have Native American blood. And that applies to both the white and black communities. So it, it's it's complicated. There's there's a lot of ties and connections. You know, I, I have heard of Native families who who sheltered um, sheltered African American refugees. I'm sure that that happened. But I'm also sure that amongst the white lynch mob, there were also people who had uh, Native ancestry as well. So you're going to victims and murderers both. I would have a comment on this as well. Uh, on the other side of my father's family. I am descended from Caesar Bruner of the Bruner Band. And so, yes, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we do have mixed heritage, African heritage, European heritage, and Native American heritage. On my father's side, and my father was actually, as it turns out, um, he wasn't raised the whole time by Florence Mary, his mother. He was raised on the other side by Ethel, Magnolia Shawnee of the Shawnee Nation. And they did not like my grandmother. They felt like she was from the wrong side of the tracks, possibly because she was a brown skinned woman because my grandmother was college educated much more so than the other side. And uh, so there's animosity there. There also are issues right now with people who are tribal members on paper, African-American freedmen who are having trouble. They, they, they belong to the Bruner Band and, and they, they were having trouble and, and uh, trying to uh, get their full rights as, as tribal members. So there's a, there, there are, you know, I, I don't, like I said, I have not been there. I'm talking about my own personal family history here. So I'm not making comments on anyone, but I'm talking about the people who are in my kinship group there. Thank you so much for sharing. The question about Tulsa, and there's a larger question in America right now about reparations. Um, and I think that the, the discussion in Washington yesterday was also about reparations for the members of the Tulsa, you know, people who endured the Tulsa massacre. Um, there's a question here about that. And, and how do you think that the Tulsa race massacre ties in with the comp conversation about reparations. Um, and I'll, I'll just leave that question open for both of you to answer. Well, I can, I'll, I'll dig in. So there's, there's been a long history of, of searching for reparations uh, in Tulsa. I mean, in fact, it even can go back to the 1920s, but you know, it's really in, with the creation of the, of the Tulsa Race Massacre uh, Commission, State Commission in the 1990s, you first had the issue of reparations really come to the fore and enter, you know, public discussion. Um, it, it, it was and is to this day a very divided and divisive issue. If you want to start a conversation at a dinner party, bring up reparations. Um, you know, the, the, the Massacre Commission recommended that the state of Oklahoma pay reparations to the 150 or so known survivors at that point. Uh, the state government did not do that. They, they missed a golden opportunity and instead presented the survivors with a gold-plated medal, all right? And uh, two years after that, around 2003, Professor Charles Ogletree of the Harvard Law School uh, and with other lawyers filed a suit on behalf of those survivors seeking reparations uh, in federal court. Uh, the case wound its way through court uh, it made it to the United States Supreme Court, but the U.S. Supreme Court would not hear the case. Um, there's a new case that was filed by attorney DeMario Solomon Simmons uh, in late summer of this past year, early fall. Um, it's winding its way through the courts right now. But this is, you know, I, I support completely the idea that that not only do <coughs> our limited numbers of survivors, but that descendants of survivors deserve some form of financial restitution for what happened. I'm not gonna say that, <coughs> excuse me, that I know what that number should be. I know that whatever the number will be, it's not going to be uh, enough. It's not gonna be as much as it should be. Um, but I, that's something that has to happen. Look, uh, the, the people in, in Greenwood 
uh, not only did they suffer, you know, uh, the loss of their homes, the loss of their businesses, the loss of their loved ones, they were let down by the city government, they were let down by the state government, they were let down by the federal government that never even bothered to investigate what had happened. And they were let down by insurance companies, some of whom are still in existence, who refused to pay the claims that they should have paid. So I believe that it's incumbent upon us as a society. I don't think it's gonna be easy to do, but it's something that we need to do. Annalisa, did you want to add to that? I just wanted to say I was very encouraged when Attorney General Merrick Garland, as one of his first official um, trips as a, a confirmed Attorney General, went to Tulsa and he went to look for himself. And I, I was very uh, touched by his comments. And I think that he didn't say this, but just tacitly, I, I, just, feel, I just felt supported. Um, I am a person who does believe that, that uh, reparations should be paid here and more broadly. I'm gonna ask the last question here and then we'll close down. Um, in a historical context, and I'm trying to figure out how exactly I want to ask this question. How far have we come since Tulsa? I would say we've come very far. There are still elements and problems and troubles, but that's, that's, that happens when you look at any situation with a three-dimensional lens, not a two-dimensional lens. Life is complicated. Human beings are complicated. And so, you know, I'm not sure, is that the right question? Has progress been made? Yes. Do we still have problems? Yes. Are we going to continue to have problems? Yes. All of those things, even though they may, may be conflicting, that's what living is about. Reconciling conflict, reconciling the irreconcilable sometimes. That's what it means to be fully human. And, and this is what we are all grappling with constantly. But we have to be in a constant state of awareness. We can't be asleep at the wheel. We have to be, I think, in a constant state of resistance uh, to things that may, may feel comforting, but are ultimately not productive and, and, and even destructive. But I think that absolutely we've made progress. We've made a lot of progress. We've come very far. At the same time, it doesn't mean that we, we have the luxury of resting on our laurels or acting like there aren't any problems. Life is complicated. It's three-dimensional and we, and we all need to just grow up and be adult about these things. Be open, be honest, forthright, and say what, state what the problems are. Nothing can heal without truth and acknowledgement. And when, when some group is empowered to suppress the truth, they have to be resisted. Well, I can't top that, but I wanna add just a, a little bit of a personal note. When I was, um, 24 years old in the summer of 1978, I came back home to Tulsa with the job of trying to turn my senior thesis into a book. And um, early on that summer, I uh, at the McFarland Library at the University of Tulsa, I found something I had never seen before. It was a very slender red volume, one of which uh, very few existed in the world. And it was of course, Mary Parrish's book. Um, it absolutely you know, changed my lot, my blew my mind, whatever you know, superlative that you want to say. And there's no question, again, that this is the most important single source on the massacre. And I just want to say, I want to salute Trinity University, Trinity University Press, but I also just want to say how grateful it is and what a thrill it is to me, Annalisa, to see you, to have you here tonight, to be able to converse with you. Um, uh, you are, you know, you are royalty to me and your family is. And I'm so appreciative of what your father did. And I'm so appreciative uh, that your grand grandmother survived this horrific event. And, and also that your great grandmother gave us this incredible document, one that, uh, uh, that Americans need to know about. So thank you very much. Thank you. As we close down for the evening, I want to kind of highlight some of the words that have been used here. Reconciliation, yet hope, the difficulties of history, how history challenges us to be better, but it challenges us to look at ourselves. And I think that 
the Tulsa massacre forces us to look at ourselves at our best when we think about the men who gathered to protect Dick Rowland and at our worst, the people who engaged in um, the massacre itself. Um, we get to see the power and the problem of mob rule at its worst. These thousands of men who went into that town probably don't do that as individuals. They do it as a mob. Um, and we know throughout history in Wilmington and in Atlanta and in, in other places, the power and the problem of mob rule, and we can never underestimate the power that it has. And so when we see that happening, we as citizens must do something to try to stop this. Um, and that was, I think, Mary Parrish's challenge to us. She did not want to see this happen again, and she feared it happening again. Um, and so I am just grateful for um, Ms. Brewer, Bruner and Mr., uh, Dr. Ellsworth. And I'm just so grateful to Mary Parrish for what she left us. Um, because she left us a documentary of the best of ourselves and the worst of ourselves. And she left us with a challenge. And so um, I thank Trinity University and Trinity University Press. And I also want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. And if you would like to purchase a copy of Ms. Parrish's book, it's, it can be you know, on the screen in the chat. It's, um, the, the promo code is there for you. But I also want to encourage everyone to by um, Dr. Ellsworth's books. Both of his books on Tulsa are just extraordinary. They are uh, our best secondary sources, I believe, on this tremendous massacre. And he has devoted his career to telling the truth of the story. And we are just so grateful to him and Ms. Bruner for their commitment to telling the story. And so on behalf of Trinity University, Trinity University Press, I thank you for your time here. And I hope that you found this evening rewarding refreshing and yet challenging. And I'm gonna turn it over to, um, gonna turn it over to Bergen Streetman who has done a great job herself in putting this event together. And so I wanna thank her as well. And so we're gonna say good night and thank you so much for your time.